What I'm going to talk about today is basically an overview of child development. So there's a narrow focus for you. Um, so there's a lot to kind of go over. Um, so in this presentation, um, I'm going to explore normal streams of development from infancy through adolescence, looking at social, physical, language, cognitive, and adaptive um, domains. We'll go over some of the major developmental milestones, discuss developmental vulnerabilities for children with X and Y variations, and um, think about guidelines for clinical care and monitoring. Um, so I hope that by the end of this almost hour, you'll be able to appreciate the developmental trajectory from infancy through adolescence, recognize um, potential developmental vulnerabilities in our population, and understand some of the differences in clinical care guidelines for children with X and Y chromosome variations. This might be the most important slide I have. So child development is absolutely not a competition. It's Every child develops at their own pace, and there are qu there's quite a bit of variation in that pace. Um, and everybody's going to be a little different. So some children walk at nine months, some at 15 months, and both are normal. Both w fall within the normal range. Um, and variability is, is typical, and each child is unique. But regardless of the exact timing, of um, milestones, there's a, there's a normal sequence of developmental progress in children that follows a very predictable pattern that should be monitored very carefully and objectively, and milestones are just one of the ways that we objectively monitor um, developmental progress. So <clears throat> what is a, a developmental milestone? Well, a developmental milestone is a functional activity achieved by a child that relates to some chronologic age. For example, walking is a developmental milestone that occurs between 9 and 18 months. To be useful, a developmental milestone should, should occur within, within a normal, um, or within a narrow normative rank, time frame, and it should be easily observable, useful to the child, and predictive of whether and when future milestones are attained. Um, failure to um, achieve milestones uh, can be caused by a variety of complex interactions um, that include things like normal maturational processes, environmental stimulation, educational history, temperament, illnesses, genetic factors. So when assessing milestones, we don't re rely on just a single milestone, but we rather look at overall patterns of development and profiles of the process of a development in any individual child. We look at different streams of development, their interactions, and their relationships. These are the five <clears throat> developmental streams or domains, um, and they include social, emotional, gross and fine motor, expressive and receptive language, nonverbal problem solving, and self-help skills. And I guess you could think of them more generally as behavior, physical development, communication, cognition, and adaptive skills. <clears throat> so in this presentation, I'm going to touch upon the milestones in each of these streams or domains of development as they occur um, during the progressive stages of childhood, which are infancy and toddlerhood, the preschool years, elementary school years, and adolescence. So we're going to start with infants and toddlers. Think about gross motor development. So gross motor milestones describe posture and locomotion, basically how a child gets from one place to another. And the progression of motor milestones is most strongly related to neurologic maturation. Um, and they have generally have very little association with general intelligence. Even um, minor motor delays do not necessarily correlate with minor cognitive de delays. But these milestones do occur in a very predictable um, progression. So here are, this is kind of the mean age of milestone acquisition. Um, and remember, each of these numbers is sort of like the top of a bell curve. So there's, a, there's sort of a broad range of normal for when they each occur, but this is just kind of the average. So when you look at motor skills, um, 
the infant first is able to hold his head up and then lift head and chest, get to elbows, push to forearms, and then by about four months, they start rolling. Rolling is followed by sitting, both you know, supported sitting and then independent sitting. Um, walking occurs on the average of, of about a year of age, um, and running comes shortly thereafter. So there's this normal progression to almost all um, milestones, milestones. Hypotonia is a fairly common finding in children with X and Y chromosome variations, and hypotonia can lead to some mild delays in milestone acquisition, and, but more importantly, to differences in the quality of motor control and to coordination. Um, so developmental doctors mostly feel that it's important not only to look at whether a particular milestone has been achieved, but we want to look at the quality of movement, the quality of that milestone, and how close the child is to actually achieving a milestone. So for example, when we think about walking, we know that there is a sequence of um, developmental progress, and we can look to see where that child is in that sequence. So in order to walk, you have to have head control, you have to have your, your prop reactions need to come in, and those are balance reactions. So for example, at five months, if you fall forward, your arms go out to catch you, and that's associated with sitting. At seven months, if you fall sideways, your arms go out. You've, you've developed that lateral protective response. And that's, that's more associated with crawling and pivoting and whatnot. And when you walk, you kind of need that backward um, protective response, and that comes in around nine months. So we can look at these things in assessing a child and kind of tell you how close a child might be to achieving a particular milestone. If quality is poor, if milestones are delayed, sometimes we bring physical therapy in to kind of help us out with that. And physical therapy can work on quality of movement, coordination, motor planning, strengthening, but they don't, it doesn't make your milestone happen any faster. Because like I said, motor milestones are most closely related with neurodevelopment. Um, but there is, a, there is good reason to have physical therapy involved um, for other reasons, and those are the quality kind of um, issues, strengthening. So moving on to another stream, um, fine motor and visual motor problem solving skills. These are, um, this refers to upper extremity and hand manipulation, as well as um, hand-eye coordination. And in infants and young children, these skills are assessed by observing the child's interaction with test objects, um, like blocks or form boards or puzzles. Um, and in older children, they're usually tested using visual motor and drawing and writing tasks. So here are some examples of sequences that we look at when we assess young children with, uh, for fine motor, visual motor, and visual perceptual issues. Um, and just to take, um, a couple of these sequences as examples. So reaching and grasp, those, those skills progress in a very predictable fashion. So an infant is fisted to, to about three months of age, mostly fisted when they're awake. Around four months, those hands start to open up. They start to manipulate their fingers. They bring hands to midline. They engage in this sort of mouth um, play. By five months, they're able to actually, oh, at four months, they also sort of start, if you hang something above them, they sort of start batting at it. And that sort of progresses into a whole hand reach and a whole hand grasp by five months. They start to reach and sort of pull things to the middle and grab. <clears throat> by, um, and that's called a radial rake. By six months, they are starting to use fingers a little bit more carefully. By nine months, they have that three-finger grasp. By 11 months, a pincer. So th that's kind of an example of how these, all of these sort of skills progress sequentially. And we can look at this and think about where a child is in certain areas and, and whether or not we have weaknesses or strengths. Um, <clears throat> if you want to look at graphomotor skills, for example, or visual motor skills, they progress in a certain sequence as well. So if you give a 12-month-old a crayon, they'll kind of tap it or tap it and make a mark. <clears throat> if you give a 16-month-old a crayon, 
and they see you scribble, they'll copy you and scribble. By 18 months, you hand them the crayon and they're just gonna scribble on their own. And then you can sort of keep going with that. So <clears throat> you make a stroke, a two-year-old should copy it. You make a stroke, a, a vertical and a horizontal line, a two and a half year old should be able to copy it. And it goes on and on. A three year old makes a circle, four year old a square. So we have ways of kind of looking at and screening for visual perceptual progress in a developmental um, sense. Here are some, some other things that we use to look at sequences um, or items that we use. You know, you might see, you might see me pull out a bell pegboard, a form board, cubes and a cup. I particularly like those because there's a lot you can do with cubes and a cup. Um, <clears throat> a 10 month old will lift the cup and kind of bang the cube. I mean, a six month old will kind of lift the cup and bang the cube. When they get to be 10 months, they start to put it near in the cup. They release it at 12 months. They, put eight, uh, they, they just go to town putting cubes and cup, cups by nine months. Um, and then you can start making figures <clears throat> and um, that different ages would be able to copy. So a four cube train, a five cube train, a, tr uh, um, a bridge, a more complex figures. And these, got, these kind of tasks go all the way up to kind of older um, age groups too and some psychological tests. So these are some of the ways that we start to look at visual um, motor and visual perceptual skills. So for children with XY variations, hypotonia and coordination difficulties can make some of these tasks pretty difficult. Um, and additionally, problems with visual motor um, coordination and visual perceptual skills early on might actually be one of our earliest manifestations of learning differences. So we pay attention to delays and differences in um, these areas. And when we see problems, we want to get intervention. Um, so OTs are the um, consultants that work a lot in these areas. They treat problems involving fine motor coordination, graphomotor coordination, visual perceptual difficulties, as well as working on upper body core strengthening and sensory um, integration issues. So moving on to kind of the language stream of development. Um, I don't know if any of you were at the speech language, the excellent speech language talk, but just remember language is not speech. They're different, different, two different issues. Speech is articulation, the production of sound. Um, and language refers more to one's ability to com communicate to others, to communicate thought and to understand um, what other people are communicating to us. So, Language progresses in a very specific um, way as well. And these are, um, we tend to think of expressive and re divide language into re receptive and expressive kind of domains and looking at milestones in young children. So in um, terms of uh, early language milestones, in the receptive domain, babies start making noises and vocalize from the very beginning. Um, by about two months, they coo, they start using um, con vowel consonant combinations by about six months, that's called babble. Um, the, by about seven or eight months, they have kind of repetitive babble, the da da da, ma 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 ma. And it doesn't necessarily mean da da mama, but it gradually emerge, it gradually progresses into a specific da da mama, and usually the da da is first. Um, by about 12 months, the first word that's not a name kind of tends to occur, and you kind of move on from there to where the babbling starts to take on intonation, and it has the cadence of language, and that's called jargon. Um, and at the same time that these ex expressive milestones are developing, receptive milestones are coming into play too. You know, you advance from social smiling to turning to to orienting to sounds in a certain way. A, a newborn just alerts to sound. At By five months, if you make a sound up and above the head, they lateralize. At seven months, they lateralize and look up. And at nine months, it's sort of a direct, um, direct gaze. So those are considered to be early prelinguistic pre receptive language milestones. 
And so you can even look at young babies and start to think about whether we have delays in some of these domains. Um, but th we go on to start to understand what no means, to be able to follow commands, first of all, with gesture, then without gesture. Um, and the milestones go on. Um, about uh, at some point when you start to get a handful of words, those words start being stuck into your jargon. That's called mature jargon. When you have about 20, 25 words, you start to, um, you get close to combining words. And the first kind of combination of words are phrases and then sentences that have verbs. So language progresses by, so that by three years of age, they have 250, 300 words. They can use sent three word sentences. You can ask them, what is your name? How old are you? Um, are you a girl or a boy? And they should pretty much be able to answer. So language progresses in this tremendously rapid fashion between two and three. And um, it's not, it progresses rapidly between one and two, but it just seems more obvious between, between two and three because that's when they start with all the words. Um, okay, so children with X and Y variations are at higher risk of language problems. We know this. We, we, and they have um, unique language problems. So we want to be on the lookout for, for the emergence of issues. Um, what I tell my trainees in my clinic and the pediatric residents that work with me, I always say, if a parent expresses a concern, you better pay attention. Because we have lots and lots of good studies that show us that you guys are usually right. And if pediatricians don't listen to you, then that pediatrician probably has a problem because uh, are they making a mistake? Um, because your kind of gauge on how you feel your child is developing is usually pretty accurate. And um, there are ways to, so whenever there's a concern, we really want to think about how to actively evaluate. So one of the ways that pediatricians actively evaluate children is through surveillance. And surveillance is just asking you things about your child at each visit. So you go in for a well baby visit and they say, can your child do you know, these three or four things? And you say, yes, well, that's surveillance. Um, <clears throat> um, screening is a more formal evaluation where they maybe give you questionnaires to fill out. Screening, st screening assessments are validated and they're objective. So they don't, that we don't just rely upon a pediatrician's intuition or what they think they see in the office. Kids don't go to there and they don't talk. You know, it's not, it's not good. So at certain points in, in pediatric care, we do screening assessments during those first early years. But if there are problems or there are issues or concerns, we don't have to wait till, you know, the 18 month visit to do a screening. We can do it at any point. And if there are, cons if there are significant concerns or if you fail a screening, then we send on for a really more detailed assessment. So that would be when you go see the speech language pathologist, when you go see the OT. Um, and the kind of problems that emerge during these th first three years include things like just delayed milestones. That's when you're, you're coming along in the right order, you're just slower. Um, language disorders get diagnosed during this time too. And a language disorder is not just a delay. A language disorder is disordered language. It's coming in in a deviant fashion. There's something wrong. This is not just a constitutional delay. Um, so articulation problems also are seen in this age group. And um, problems with pragmatics. So pragmatic language refers to the social, to social communication. We use our eyes, we use nonverbal communication, we use, we pick up on the social cues of others. We start to see problems in these areas in very young children. I mean, social, social development is complex from infancy all the way through, through um, adolescence. So we can start to pick up on some of these things. And if we do, we need to be evaluated. We need to get intervention. Um, <clears throat> so this is a slide that kind of goes over social and emotional development. And I could probably give a whole, we could give a whole talk and spend a whole hour on, on um, social emotional development. But basically, 
I'm just going to go through, touch upon different things at different sort of age um, ranges. So newborns are amazingly intact with regard to their sort of whole neurologic system. A newborn has a, is born with a preference for faces. You, a newborn's vision is about eight to 10 inches, so they can see the, mater, the mother's face, and they seem to be ha have a preference for that face above everything else. Um, and within days, they recognize the mother's smell. Um, they have a number of reflexes that they're born with. They're primitive reflexes like grasping and rooting. These are reflexes that kind of emerge into voluntary movement in the next few months. Um, babies eat seven to eight times a day. They sleep about 75% of the time, and, but very um, rapidly, really, they start to learn to sleep a little more at night. So a neurologically intact baby kind of starts to get beyond the, the the, um, start, starts to establish sleep patterns fairly early. By one month, those patterns ought to be good. They ought to be into a routine of sleeping and eating, feeding, pooping. Um, they can vocalize at this point. Cooing starts pretty soon around two months. Um, they respond to their parent sound differentially, in, and they're only, what, four weeks old. They um, do a lot of they gain almost an ounce a day, two pounds a month. Um, so that's kind of your physiologic stability is what the newborn is all about in the first couple of months of life. By two months, two months, we're talking about developing trust. And by trust, what I'm referring to is infants need to learn to trust that their needs are going to be met. So when a baby cries, you've got to respond. This is, this is really essential for long-term social-emotional development. So you, it's not even possible to spoil a baby. They have needs and they need to learn that their needs are going to be satisfied. Um, by three months, they actually engage the attention of the adults. They've learned that they do things and they can get attention. Um, they have differentiated crying. This is the, a three-month-old has a hungry cry and a hurt cry and different cries. So they've already started to kind of interact with their environment. They follow objects with their eyes. They rea react to um, familiar objects and familiar people. Um, so by four months, they start to know what is familiar and not familiar, the normal versus the strange. Um, five months, we are imitating fa facial expressions, imitating sounds, um, reacting to our name, um, turning to sounds differently. The six-month-old is a, t is a, is a um, has begun to predict what's going to happen next. So they can kind of anticipate the next action of a parent. Um, and seven-month-old is completely socially reciprocal. You coo, you laugh, you laugh back and forth. It, it's, um, and, and they have social referencing. So they have um, progressed very rapidly to a much more advanced stage of social development. Um, by nine months, you sort of, you see the first peak of social anxieties. They know strangers and they're moody. Nine month olds have moods. They're sad, they're happy, they're angry, they're afraid, they're, they're in strange places. So nine month olds are great fun. Um, they've started, at, at that age, they've started to crawl a lot of the time. So they're exploring their environment and they get frustrated real easily. So a lot of parenting at eight months and nine months is kind of spent redirecting a child and keeping them safe. Um, then by, sorry, by, between 12 and 26 months, we have this great progress in cognitive and physical development. The toddler goes, um, um, starts to understand himself as an independent person between 12 and 36 months. Um, so there's this growing awareness of self versus other. Um, they can tolerate independence a little bit, bit more. This is where the child sort of starts to go away from you and look back and check in. Um, social relationships and mo emotional dependence on the primary caretaker kind of starts to shift. 
so that they become a little more enthusiastic about the presence of other children um, by the time they're, they're three. Um, they're sensitive to how things are supposed to be. So by three years old, if a child, you say the doll's arm is missing, well, that three-year-old is going to know it, and it's not going to be a happy thing. Um, or dirt on a shirt, things like that. So they, they have this sense of, how, of order. Um, and they start to attempt, a, in, in, imitate adults in their play. They become much more assertive. So that, that stage, up until three, there are a lot of changes that occur. Um, then we get to, um, oh, this, the, the adaptive stream of development. So unlike in motor milestones, which are almost entirely neuromaturationally kind of determined, Social and adaptive skills rely heavily of, upon the environment. So parental um, involvement has a big part to play in adaptive skill development as well as social skill development. Um, so during the first three years of life, infants develop from almost complete dependence to three-year-olds who sleep through the night, mostly dress themselves, feed themselves with utensils, and assist in simple household chores putting away toys. So those are the, these are the uh, essential sort of adaptive skills that we go through in early childhood. Then we move into the preschool years. Um, the preschool age child is really primed and ready with their own, with his or her own unique style and their own temperament. They have a sense of belonging and attachment already, and they're ready to make their first steps kind of out into the world. So this is the developmental stage. It's marked by the emergence of sex typing and gender role identification, and it's usually associated with um, parent role models. So um, a lot happens here. The, this is this age in which a conscience starts to emerge. So you see the development of, they develop the, capa the capacity for collaborative play and the beginning to beginning of mastery over aggressive impulses. So they have to, they learn a little bit of self-control. Um, um, this is also the period in which the child is increasingly ready to go out and interact socially with peers, um, with less adult supervision like in preschools and daycares. Um, we see the evolution of a round, plump uh, three-year-old to a slimmer, elongated five-year-old. They gain um, voluntary control over bowel and bladder habits. Their motor coordination improves. Their balance improves. That al this allows for um, s social play activities, things like climbing, swinging, uh, doing things like modeling clay and drawing and, their, their, and physical activity. Um, but motor skills are not quite ready for other activities that require a great deal of accuracy, accuracy like sports. They're not ready for bas baseball or ballet or soccer quite yet. Cognitive development. So toddler thinking is really based on trial and error. Um, Jean Piaget, Piaget was a Swiss psychologist who described children in this preschool age group as having something called magical thinking. So a preschooler may feel as though his or her thinking can influence events. So they have difficulty seeing the point of view of others. They may feel that events occur for their own benefit. So examples of this would be, you know, if you ask them questions like, why does the sun shine to keep me warm? Uh, why is there snow for me to play in? Um, why do trees have leaves to keep me warm? These are the, this is the kind of thinking um, that you see oops, in preschoolers. So, and it's important to realize this because this is the age where a child doesn't, you have to think about, about how they kind of view the world, especially from a medical standpoint. So a child this age might associate illness with bad behavior or um, the birth of a sibling with the death of a pet if they occurred in some sort of similar time frame. So reasoning, so when you are dealing with children this age, you have to be very concrete and try to, try to think about how they might be kind of perceiving the world. Um, they go from hundreds to thousands of words by age five. Um, they start to um, use more complex language. Their sentence structure pr 
progresses. They use pronouns, prepositions. They start to use connected language. They can follow commands, answer some questions, and speech to be completely understandable to um, other people. Um, social and emotionally, the preschool years um, are characterized by this growing awareness of their, of their own self as distinct from others and from, from the rest of the world. They, this is the age at which little girls practice behaviors that they believe are characteristic of women. Boys do things that they, that they learn typify men. They begin to role play. Role play is related to their own gender identity. And by five, most kids show preference in their activities related to their sex. Um, during the preschool years, they start to interact more with other children, and they get feedback from that interaction that kind of molds behavior. So, for example, a five-year-old who carries a teddy bear to school, that child may be discouraged by his parents from doing that, and he's probably going to get teased by his peers, and that with that negative feedback, his behavior is likely to change, and he may choose to bring maybe a favorite baseball hat instead of a teddy bear to school. So behavior is modified by the expanding kind of environment that the child is in. They experience, they can now experience emotions in, related, in relation to other um, people. So they might feel guilt, or they might feel embarrassment when they, they attract unwelcome attention. They might feel envy uh, when someone else is praised. Um, but they still believe in their own, uh, so they still, they, they're starting to get a sense of their own limits and can consider other people now in their, sort, in their thought processes. So they've moved beyond the egocentric view of the world and they start to understand that they're not the cause and center of the universe anymore. Um, and they incorporate basic standards um, of good and bad at this age. Um, and they begin to set goals for themselves and they seek help from parents in achieving those goals. Um, so by the time they reach six, which is about the age that we enter school, they've learned a lot from the roles that they um, have been expected to play up until now and how to behave in the world. They can, con they can control their aggressive feelings. They um, have learned how to respect the rights of others, and they have a clear sense of themselves, their abilities, and the ways in which they re react to different situations. And they're starting to develop um, a conscience. They have gained a gender identity, and they typically identify in many ways with their parents. Um, they have, by the end of um, preschool, they should be able to do buttons and zippers in addition to dress themselves. They use utensils pretty well. They're fairly independent in toileting. They have good, hopefully good, sleeping habits. Um, and this is also the age in which you see nightmares and night terrors, which are normal. So we're moving now into the elementary school year, um, age group, six through 11. And this is a year, these are years of explosive, um, um, well, you've had explosive growth up, up until now in terms of physical and development, it, but it kind of slows at this stage of um, uh, elementary school age. The limbs lengthen, there's a subtle loss of baby fat, um, but what you see is rapid progress in psychological, cognitive, and social development during this age. So um, on an average, a six-year-old is 50 pounds, 42 inches, but by adolescence, they double their weight and they measure about five feet tall. So they're growing, but it's not as slow as, it's not as rapidly as previously. Um, boys um, are about the same height as girls in first grade, but between nine and 10, girls have a growth spurt and add weight. Um, and boys' growth spurt occurs a little bit later. So you go through this period of time in which the girls are taller than the boys. Um, the brain matures and expands. The head growth is relatively small, about an inch between six and 12, and it's almost adult size. But what's happening is that complex connections within the brain um, are forming, and so that allows for this dramatic psychological and cognitive um, progression. Um, and during this period, motor skills become refined more and more so that you have better coordination. You can start to do some of the activities that school-age kids do. Um, in this age group, they socially, they start to be less interested in, 
in home and more in um, interest in community. Um, their previous self-image was primarily related to their family, like, oh, I'm somebody's daughter or child. Now we're getting to the point where they are defining themselves in terms of their experiences. So I'm a good reader. I'm the girl who stands up to boys on the playground. Um, play at this age um, includes negotiation and compromise. Um, they learn to play in groups and on teams and to operate within parameters of defined rules. So this is the age when you start t-ball and you move on to baseball. You do all kinds of um, group physical activities. Um, they typically um, have, in preschool, they have playmates of both sexes, but as you move into the school age years, children start to prefer the same sex. Um, and by third grade, they tend to stick mostly to the same sex in their play. Um, preschoolers understand physical value, but not the importance of motivation um, when we're talking about emotional development. So they, they, they understand that if something's broken, it's not good, but they don't understand who broke, uh, did, was it accidentally broken or was it intentionally broken? When you get into school age, we start to be able to think about right and wrong and um, um, we start to, be, to think a little bit more complexly about these kind of issues. Um, but still, they're primarily concerned about punishment and reward. So the choices are made based on physical consequences and on their own needs. So the, the kind of rationale you might see from a school age children is, oh, I'm not going to hit my sister even though I want to because I'm going to get in trouble and I won't get to watch my TV show. So parenting is kind of um, uh, involves a lot of uh, rules and consequences and things like that. Okay, so we have this gradual transition during the school um, age, the elementary school age years from um, exclusively selfish behaviors in preschoolers through social expediency to consideration for others. And this transition is really a reflection of the child's ability to understand cause and effect, and it's what um, Piaget called concrete operations, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. But school-aged children, um, start to internalize rules and um, they will start to show empathy for others. They are becoming more aware of others' feelings, not just their own feelings. So qualities like trust and loyalty become more important in relationships during, um, child, during middle childhood to um, approaching adolescence. Okay, cognitive development changes dramatically. Like I said, in, in uh, these elementary school years, we have um, children that can perform increasingly complex operations mentally so that they can start to um, think about things in their head, not just require physical manipulation. For example, a seven-year-old may appreciate that a liquid uh, remains the same regardless of the shape of the container. An eight-year-old can have a piece of clay and know that that clay, no matter what shape you form it into, it has the same mass and the same weight. This was not something that a younger child was capable of understanding because the older child now has kind of reached concrete operations. The um, ch children are able at this age to consider two or more aspects of a situation. So for example, he um, for the first time may be able to think of another child who is clumsy but bright, or a teacher who's strict but fair, or medicine that's hard to swallow but it brings down a fever. There are good aspects and bad aspects of things. Um, they become more flexible in their, in their logic, um, and they become aware that other people may have different opinions and can start to think about how their own actions um, can be viewed by others. One of the most important things about um, this age is that it is very important for a child to be able to feel a sense of accomplishment. One of the core um, um, challenges of elementary school age children is to develop a sense of um, competency. And that can be done in a variety of ways. Um, um, they start to be able to feel good about helping around the house, doing chores, 
you know, hitting a baseball, many different things. And this is really crucial to the child's development at this age because um, if they aren't successful, they develop a sense of inferiority which can be present um, for a pro prolonged period of time and affect life pretty significantly. So we want to be able to pick up on difficulties that children have um, in this age group. And the types of things that kind of come up include learning problems, social skill deficits, and language deficits. So it's really important to assess the child during this stage, not miss some of these things, to be thinking about it and to get intervention, but it's also very important to look for strengths in the children so that you can build on them because this is the, the age of industry, the age in which we want them to feel competent and self-confident. So while we are working on um, intervening in whatever weaknesses that they may have, we also want to think very uh, carefully about what we can do to help them feel good about the, and give them a sense of accomplishment. That's one of the vital developmental um, issues of this kind of stage of life. Okay, so academic achievement. So much of our, um, so in our society, a lot of the work that the of the child takes place in the classroom, obviously. By seven, most children can decode basic symbol symbols, and then they start to learn to encode, which um, involves accessing previously gained knowledge, organizing it, in a, and expressing it verbally or in writing. Children learn to encode in elementary school things like writing an essay, solving a numerical word problem, or examples of encoding. And many children, has, children have problems with encoding for a vi variety of underlying reasons, things like expressive language disorders, attentional deficits, motor problems, and emotional problems. So when these problems arise, we need to evaluate for underlying neurodevelopmental disabilities. Um, this is an age when you may need to get a neuropsychological done, when you may need to think about how the cognitive and language abilities affect things, how the complicated interplay of attentional issues uh, may impact the situation. Um, because as you go through those first few elementary school years, you, there's this dramatically increasing demand for encoding and output. And if a child has difficulties, they're liable to fall through the cracks um, at this age. So um, this is when you may, we often start to consider neuropsychological, psychoeducational evaluations and other things. Um, the adaptive domain in this age group is really all about building responsibility and growing in the independence. So we know that school age children have this increasing need to, to develop a sense of competency and we can do that in a lot, we can support that through a lot of um, w ways, through many ways, through many possible um, ways, including things like um, giving them an allowance, helping them to succeed with um, act in activities or um, just being supportive of anything that might help with them with their self-esteem. So these are the sorts of um, adaptive um, issues that face the school-age child. So now we're close to adolescence. This is a slide that kind of um, shows what happens with puberty. So puberty is the, this, this is the Physical development in adolescence is um, pretty, pretty central at this age group. So what happens in girls is that you first start with breast development, somewhere around 11. Then you get pubic hair development a little bit thereafter, and that's when sort of the growth curve peaks, so they really start growing uh, rapidly at this point. Menses occurs somewhere about two years after the onset of uh, breast bud development, and um, growth pretty much is over somewhere around 14 to 15. In boys, on the other hand, that growth curve occurs a few years later and lasts longer. 
So they could, some boys are still growing into the, at 21, you know, up till 21. Um, the first pubertal development in a male is um, testicular enlargement, um, penile growth, and they start to get some pubic hair. The growth spurt starts and um, sperm mark occurs somewhere around age 14 and a half. This is, this is a little bit variable, but that's um, sort of what happens in puberty. So they're going through pretty dramatic physical changes, very dramatic physical changes in those um, adolescent years from 10 to 15. They're, and th they're also going through a lot of psychological changes. So this is the time of apprenticeship, learning to handle adult responsibilities. Um, Piaget, the, um, the Swiss developmental psychologist, said that by age 12, the child develops a more logical structure to his thought process and some capacity for abstract thought and reason. And eventually, adolescents are able to think about possibilities, to consider hypotheses, to think ahead, um, and beyond, con um, and, and they have more advanced thought processes. So for example, a school-aged child, when asked, well, I'm, I'm gonna skip this because I'm running a little late. I'm gonna go a little bit ahead. So this is called the formal operation stage as opposed to the concrete operational stage because they can think about various possibilities and analyze things from multiple um, points of view. Um, they have increased ability to use abstract verbal concepts. So for example, if you give a, a series of sentences each containing a nonsense word, and ask the child to figure out the meaning of the word from context. Younger children back in concrete operations would look at each sentence um, and thinking and determine what the words mean in each sentence and they may have different meanings in different sentences. But the older adolescent has more um, abstract uh, abilities and they can deduce meaning um, and apply that meaning across all of the sentences and the structures. So, the um, formal operations sort of stage of, co of cognitive de development emerges here in a, the adolescent um, age group. And this means that they can now engage in abstract thought. Um, they're able to examine complex issues that previously they weren't intellectually able to grasp, things like politics and religion and morality. Um, you ask a 10-year-old, what, what should be done to stop a crime wave? And that 10-year-old is probably going to say, oh, we should p punish everybody, they should go to jail if they break the law. But when you get to adolescence, they start to consider more complex issues like, oh, maybe we should give leniency if it's a first-time offender, or maybe we should re make up some reform programs. And so they, they move on to a whole different sort of level of, of um, analysis and abstract thought. And this is also a time of self-discovery. So the adolescent is kind of learning who they are, what they're all about. They're thinking about what they want to do with themselves. And with all of this change and all of these, this progress in, in more abstract thought, this is a point where self-esteem can sort of, if it was good before, it might become a little weaker now, particularly with girls who have to deal with um, um, rapidly changing bodies and um, a lot of peer pressure and emphasis on physical attractiveness. So it's kind of a vulnerable period for both boys and girls, but in some ways particularly for girls. Okay. Socially, this is a stage where adolescents prefer their friends to their family. Um, they, and that's just normal. They choose friends who have similar attitudes and values as well as interests. And they value loyalty and closeness. So girls say they want friends who understand their feelings. But boys, they want friends who can, they can go out and do things with, who will stand up for them if they're in trouble. This is the stage initially where they start to sit together at lunch, boys and girls, so it's no longer just the boys and the girls, that's like little small groups. And as you advance through adolescence, um, later in adolescence is when, you know, dating occurs more. So usually it starts off with little male-female groups and then you kind of move on to more complex one-on-one -on -one relationships. Um, peer pressure is a big issue. 
So this is a point at which they, these kids are pressured to conform both to their family kind of values as well as to their peer, the, their peers. And so this is a time when parents really need to be there. The kids need to know that they have this constant presence of the adults, that they're, they're being supported, but also that the adults are enforcing rules and limits because they, there's a comfort in having rules and limits that they may not act like it, but there is. So they need, they need a lot of support. Um, with all of this change, there are vulnerabilities. So mental health issues are not that uncommon in teen teenagers. It's very important to keep communication constant, open, and honest. They need, you need to understand that if mental health issues occur, they are often very treatable and you need to be on the lookout for behavioral changes that may be a concern. Um, some of the um, red flags of adolescence include excessive sleeping beyond normal, loss of self-esteem, abandonment of, or loss of interest in previous activities or things that they really liked, dramatic changes in mood, um, changes in academic performance, changes in weight and appetite, um, and um, personality shifts. So if you see any of that, those are red flags. You might need to talk to your physician or, or get some help. And these are some of the vulnerabilities that we often think about in terms of our adolescence. Depression and anxiety are the two biggies. So it's, I'm gonna, this is um, almost my last slide. So there are, these are the signs that, and symptoms that you may want to look for in terms of depression. As far as anxiety goes, um, the most important thing to know here is that if there is a significant anxiety which can wax and wane over time, starting from very early ages, get help because anxiety in adolescence predisposes to things like self-medication, drug use, marijuana use, and other things. So there's a good reason to address anxiety in adolescence. These are some of the other kind of vulnerabil vulnerabilities that we see in the adolescent age group um, that we can address. Um, and one thing about substance abuse is that don't just think of normal drugs. You've got to think of things like over-the-counter stuff um, and prescribed medications too.